As technology lawyers, Vic, um, I think robotics is an extension of existing technology. And the reason I say that is because over the course of the last 20 years, um, and with a nod to Moore's Law, which we all know about, uh, computers have, have reduced in size, they've increased in power, so that's from a pure hardware perspective. Software has, has developed dramatically, so we're looking at the miniaturization of computing. And as a result of that, we're looking at a different breed of machines that can take on board a lot of information, can do things that existing machines, and by that I mean things like laptops, desktops, supercomputers, mm. servers, can do things and interact with us in different ways. And by way of example, if I'm looking at some of the robots that are coming out, the, the humanoid type robots that are coming out mm. in Japan, yes, they're small, they're small machines, but they interact and they do different things to, 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 to laptops, mm. for example. Um, the, the, the way that we as humans interact with computing is going to change. It used to be cards, and then it was keyboards, and then it was mice, and it was touchscreen. But actually that voice interaction mm. um, is going to play a, a, a major development in, in robotics. And, and it's been, um, fr frankly, the only way that robotics is going to enter into our consciousness is, is by making it a lot more easy or easier for us to interact with these types of machines. Yeah, what do you think? Absolutely, yeah, Chris. I mean, as technology lawyers, you're right. I mean, these things are going to have huge implications about uh, the way business is done and how society operates, mm. and it will change a lot of that. And I think it will raise a lot of uh, unique legal issues around how they operate, and, and there's a lot of unique aspects to robotics that means that it raises some interesting legal issues that we as lawyers need to be on top of in terms of advising our clients. Yeah, and I think we've been through this sort of stage before as technology lawyers. I mean, if we, and I know I'm a lot older than you, Vic, but um, if I go back to, if I go back to the mid 90s, and the movement of computing out, out of basements, um, out of big corporate basements into onto people's desks with the advent of client server, and then you're looking at laptops, and then you're looking at the, the, the well, looked at the, the, the increase in e-commerce, the, 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 the uh, development of the internet and social mo mobile applications and m mobile phones, smartphones. They're, the way that the law has developed uh, over that course of 20 years has played catch up with the technology admittedly, but it has developed. It has developed rules and structures to deal with mm. the, the interaction of man and machine um, and the use of these new technologies. So I think it's inevitable that with a new breed of machine, a new type of um, a set of processing and robotics, that the law will have to develop new ways of dealing with new technologies, mm. which doesn't mean that existing principles um, uh, will, will, will fall by the wayside. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for me, a big question is uh, not necessarily uh, a question of each time creating a new law to deal with every type of robotic issue. It's right. it's how does our existing legal framework stretch to adapt and uh, evolve to, to to cater for some of these unique aspects. Exactly. Which brings us on to the topic of how the laws change and the main legal issues that we think will arise uh, as, as new technology develops. For example, liability laws, Vic, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting question, Chris. I mean, who is liable for the damage caused by a robot? Because inevitably there will be damage caused by robots as soon as the first driverless cars hit the streets or the first care robots come into use at some point they will inevitably cause some damage or harm to humans. Now, at what point do we attribute liability to the manufacturer or the user yeah. or the networks provider when in a situation where you couldn't point to the robot itself lacking legal capacity to take responsibility? Right. You've got a number of players in the mix and allocating that liability where it lies correctly will be a really complex issue. Do we take an example of the driverless car and cars these days are packed full of technology, so as the Google car develops, um, are we looking at, and, and, and actually the manufacturer's car, so 
General Motors, Volvo, Mercedes, every manufacturer is getting into this mm. in, into this area and they're looking at developing cars with more and more technology in it. Are we looking at the motor manufacturers taking full responsibility for it or are we looking at the, the, the component parts? Is it software providers? Mm. Is it going to be the hardware providers? Is it going to be the, 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 man, the manufacturers as a systems integrator taking responsibility mm. for all of these things? Or is it going to be a combination of all of those? Yeah. I think that's a really interesting point. Another really interesting issue is around data privacy and data protection. In a situation where you've got robots collecting masses of data, sometimes sensitive data, in the case of things like care robots in the home. There are some major data privacy issues, particularly where these things are connected to networks and prone to hack hacking, hacking and cyber security type risks. What do, you, what do you think of those things? I think it's inevitable that, again, looking at the miniaturization of the technology, um, as machines interact with, with, with us in different ways, we will have and um, will be providing machines in our houses and at work with a huge amount of information. Mm. Um, the Internet of Things plays a major part, I think, in the development of robotics at an early stage. If we look at machines talking to machines, gathering information, and then uh, allowing or, or interacting again with different machines to make decisions and, 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 and to, to develop different applications and different solutions, then there is a whole range of data being collected from subjects and we have, as a, as a subject, we have absolutely no idea where that data is going. If I'm a driver of a car, uh, do I really expect the way I drive or how I drive to be put into a huge great data cloud mm. and analysed to death by insurers or other car manufacturers mm. or indeed logistics uh, governmental logistics departments are looking at transport and safety. Do I expect all of my information to be put into that, um, churned, and for someone to come up with an answer about road design? Mm. Because if I don't, then I might be sorely upset to, to find out that it has. Yeah. And I'm sure that without proper safeguards, all of that information will end up in those great clunking machines who, which are doing and making all these decisions. And I think from a, from a care robot perspective, and, and healthcare is a major area where robotics is going to be, going to be used, I and mean, we already have surgical systems, and, and in parts of the world like Japan, people are talking about the care robots. There is access to a huge amount of personal information, um, medical conditions, etc. That could be used for good or for, for ill. Mm -hmm. So, yes, let's go back to the, the fundamental, these are machines. Let's go back to the fundamental that we're talking about software and hardware, which is, which is interacting with other machines, interacting with the Internet of Things on a binary perspective, so data will be used in different ways. I agree, and I think you'd have to build in the safeguards up front to try and actually get users to actually take on and take up these, these new products. I'm really interested as well, Chris, in some of the intellectual property issues that might be raised by robots, especially in a scenario where as robots adapt and learn and learn new behaviours and about their environment and start generating outputs independently of any human interaction. I mean, I wonder how that plays out in existing intellectual property law where you've got rules and laws around computer generated works, but that's always where there's been a, a human hand involved. Now, if a robot's autonomously producing its own output, like who, what, what do you think some of the intellectual property issues might be there? Well, I think the existing the existing copyright laws, for example, in, in England, um, they can deal with that, that g automatically generated output. Mm. I think the question that you've raised around how ha the human hand, is the human hand um, involved to such a degree in that type of Internet of Things environment, or can you point back to say, well, at least someone has coded mm. these things, and in particular ways, there are algorithms that have been written by humans. Um, and as a result of that interaction between machines, between algorithms, so hardware, software, and the coding and the interpretation of the data, we could point to an author at some, at some stage. It's going to be an area that I think everyone needs to look at, because the lines will be blurred. You know how intelligent will these these machines become, uh, and the more intelligent they become, and the works that they produce moves further and further away from the original author. Yeah, really interesting. Really interesting. I mean, as well as some of those kind of broader legal concepts that I think will be tested and challenged as as time goes by. I'm sure. really interested in some of the sort of the business legal uh, principles that might affect it. The the way that uh, commercial models might change. You, you touched earlier on how commercial contracts might change for the provision of IT services, or um, or, or in, in terms of employment law issues around what it means to be a worker 
and if we if we start seeing robots challenge the hegemony of, of white collar workers, what would that mean uh, for employment law and redundancies and things like that? It's really uh, absolutely, because of the ubiquity um, that technology has um, in the workplace, certainly in the Western world, uh, the developed world, um, robotics will be a technology that will replace to a certain degree, mm -hmm. I think, computing as, as we understand it at the moment. And so it will it will touch all parts of our lives. So there are all parts of our lives that are covered by by law, by regulation, by precedent. And so I think all areas of life, mm. all areas of law will have to will have to think about the implications of what we're talking about, even down to things like sports law. Mm and debates around what it is to be human if you've got a prosthetic limb mm. that can th throw you down the track at 150 miles an hour all of a sudden you know you, you, i know that there the, are the, all sorts of discussions around around doping and the rest of it at the moment mm. but from a robotics and technology perspective if we can enhance the already enabled um to what extent are you are, are we going to allow yeah. this technology to be used in the in the sports field mm. Um, it's a it's a very interesting question. It, it, it's it's a question that philosophers mm. and ethicists will be debating, I am sure. But it will all have an impact um, on the law moving forward. I think the interesting thing about global trends and robotics law is the fact that, as a as a descriptor, people are becoming more aware mm. of the fact that robotics law is a discipline mm. in and of itself. Mm. If you go back a a few years. Um, if you go back to the early 80s, for example, computer law arrived and everyone was thinking about, well, what does that actually mean? What, is, what does computer law mean? Is it, is it a separate body of law that have all of a sudden just developed overnight? Mm. Or is it the way that existing laws are being used to deal with mm. a, a new technology? And I think to a certain extent robotics law f will fit into that mm. category. More and more people are talking about it, more and more lawyers are aware of it. There is more of a debate um, on the internet and everywhere else about how the law will deal with driverless cars, how the law will deal with liability, how the law will deal with negligence. Mm. And so it is a body of law that will develop around this technology and this practice. So the good news is for technology lawyers and robot lawyers um, is that people are beginning to understand that it has, it is different. It is different from what's gone on in the past. And I think that will continue. Yeah, absolutely. And in terms of some of the global trends we're seeing at the moment, we know that uh, Europe and the UK are really active in this area. You had the you had the EU funded robo law project that mm -hmm. came out last year, and yeah. they, they reported back on some of the legal and policy issues around robotics and delivered a bit of a framework in there, Chris, about about how regulators in member states should should, should, should approach these areas as they develop. And yeah, incredibly, interesting. incredibly incredibly good piece of work, mm. um, thoroughly thought provoking, mm. uh, and. As it was developed in September 2014, yeah. 2014, I think it came out. In you know, you're looking at a future thinking yeah. around a new technology. So how is to a certain degree, how are, how should and it's providing a certain number of guidelines. How should legislators and how sh how should lawyers view these types of trends? Mm -hmm. So debates around what it is to be human um, uh, was part and parcel of the, of what came out of that Robo Law project, and the fact that it was sponsored by the EU mm -hmm. out of a, out of an industry fund which is looking at future tech, mm -hmm. um, I think is even more important because it, it shows the focus and it shows the the the, the, the interest that the EU has. In this technology, mm. and it shows um, it shows how it gives us a, a, a window into the future mm. about how industry, society, the law needs yeah. to needs to work and operate. Um, and closer to home in the UK, I know that as uh, the UK government, through initiatives like Innovate UK, are really pushing robotics and looking to. To, to frame the UK as a robotics hub, and as, as they do that, I think we're seeing more discussion and more more narrative around policy and legal issues. And, and certainly, we, 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 we've been speaking and blogging about the subject, and I think we, we, we're seeing that we have. more taken up by by industry as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, it's it's a key area for the EU. It's a key area for the UK. We're looking at the the, the, the production of very high level jobs. 
um, so that more skilled employees can work within the UK, within the EU. I mean, it is a real focus of the EU. It's been earmarked as one of the leading technologies and mm -hmm. uh, areas of focus to enhance the the employ the employees ranks um, and to enhance our abilities to produce world leading technology. And the interesting thing about what's going on, especially it, it, from a, from an outsourcing perspective, is that. A few years ago, there were a lot of jobs that were outsourced overseas. Um, there's a lot of those types of processes that are now being fully automated, mm. and the jobs are coming back on shore to the UK, where the the, the amount of technology that is required in order to, to automate those processes mm. is more prevalent here than somewhere else. So, if you're working on the basis of a, a, a wage arbitrage effect, which is why business moved to these, some of its processes offshore in the first place. Actually, if you take out the, the human being, if you like, and, and automate it, the wage arbitrage effect no longer exists. In fact, it's a lot cheaper for a software program to do it over the long term than it is for a human being. So you can see a lot more insourcing of, of work and functions back, 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 back at home, back in the UK. Uh, uh, absolutely, and it, it is part of that, there's part of that upskilling, if you like, of, of our workforce. This is one major area where the government, Innovate UK, the EU, technologists yeah. are all going to work together and including lawyers. Yeah. And what's really interesting to me, Chris, is seeing people in the US and the UK and Europe really try and get a handle on some of these issues early in a way that they may not have in in terms of data protection, which we've yes, still got exactly. a data protection act uh, from, from the 90s, obviously one has been replaced, but it'll always be a step behind technology progress and it's really interesting to see uh, people trying to get a handle on these issues as soon as they can to try and, try and influence the debate rather than be reactive. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's incredibly important. I mean, in order to foster the technology, we must have a framework that allows it to develop. Um, we must not over-regulate, so to prevent things like driverless cars going on the roads and providing extra services and extra jobs. Um, replacing some, yes, but you know, this is a new technology. Uh, new technologies have always developed their own niche employment markets that then grow. So it's very important that um, legislators and lawyers get to grips with these things early so that it's not it's not scary mm. it's not scary stuff mm. um, you know the killer robot headline is something that no one wants to see uh, yes the technology could be used for ill absolutely if we were talking about drones but there's a whole lot of good that comes out yeah. of all these things so mm. it's it's a very important area and as we've seen from the past through the development of the internet and the explosion of social mobility and the number of jobs that that's created a number of enormous companies that's mm. created over the course of 10 years. Mm. Um, this is a new technology which we all hope goes exactly the same way. The future is exciting for robotics law. The future is very exciting for ro robotic lawyers, if we can call ourselves mm. that, which yeah, is always yeah, a dangerous yeah. thing to do. <laughs> um, development, development of, of, of the practice, development of the ideas, engaging in conversations with, with, with technology, engaging in conversations with government. Um, I, I think that the, the, the future is, is very bright. It is, a, it is a technology that will change the way we do things. Mm. Um, and here's a prediction that in five years time, or maybe less, within the legal magazines and the press, there will be adverts for lawyers who understand robotics. That is my prediction. Mm. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. I, I think it's really interesting. Over the, over the short to medium term, I think we're going to see some of these issues we've been talking about today really tested. Mm. The, the employment impact of yes. robot workers, we're going to see IP issues, we're going to see data privacy, liability issues as soon as the first driverless cars take to the road and the first care robots come into use. We're going to see how our existing frameworks can adapt to these things. And my, my prediction, Chris, would be that by exception, uh, we regulate robots in a fair way that doesn't over-regulate and stifle innovation. Well, would be my hope more than a prediction anyway. Yeah, no. Um, no, I'm with you. I'm with you absolutely on all of that. Um, but let's see how it all develops. Yeah. I mean, it's exciting times at Bristow's. We're on the cookie jar. Um, and it doesn't get much better than that. Agreed. I think we look forward to contributing to the debate. Yeah. Thank you for watching. <laughs>